There are no secrets about the world of nature. There are only secrets about the thoughts and intentions of men. J. Robert Oppenheimer might be the most fascinating person of the 20th century. A man torn between curiosity and guilt, ripped apart by a powerful mind and a deep conscience. He would shoulder the emotions and imagination of a world rocked by war and scientific discovery, both frightening and captivating. As you may already know, Oppenheimer was a physicist who ran the Manhattan Project, successfully developing the world's first atomic bomb. It might seem obvious why a successful physicist would be selected to do so, but there is more to it than that. And it is actually in his greatest weaknesses in the field of physics that made him the only person for the job. Oppenheimer had a mind that was difficult for anyone to fully understand, having been on the brink of madness and depression more than once. But this man might be the key to how we need to start rethinking in a world with increasingly rapid scientific advancement, a world where we need to start understanding why we do what we do, not just how to do it. I have to admit, in exploring this man, I couldn't help but go deeper than I normally would. His troubles, his aching desires, emotions, and pains that lived alongside a deep love for humanity left me continuously wanting more, wanting to get as close as possible to the mind of this brilliant, complicated man. What you will find in this video is not the same generic run through his life biography. Here you will see my effort to peel back the onion on a mind so complex, so emotionally charged that it impacted me significantly to do so. One question that kept bothering me was how is it that this man was able to understand the importance of this task in a way that no one else quite could? If it was actually the things that made him bad at many parts of professional science that made him perfect for leading this effort, what exactly was his gift? The answer to that, I promise, will surprise you. I can confidently say that J. Robert Oppenheimer is one of the most important humans to have ever lived, and was far more than a disciplined scientist dedicated to his craft. He was a poet, humanitarian, tortured physicist, and powerful visionary in his own right. So let's get into it. I present to you the life, mind, and personal philosophy of Oppenheimer, the father of the atomic bomb. But before we do, it's come to our attention that most people watching our videos aren't yet subscribed to our channel. So please hit that subscribe button, leave a comment, and a like if you enjoyed this video. It would really help us get some attention from the algorithm. Part of what can explain Oppenheimer's standout mind and personality was his fairly isolated, albeit comfortable, upbringing. His parents were well-to-do and supported many of his interests, but certainly leaned him towards an intellectual life. His oldest and longest-lasting life obsession was actually poetry, especially metaphysical poetry, which shares a strong relationship with philosophical thinking. He was even invited to deliver a lecture to the Mineralogy Club of New York City at the age of just 12. From very young, it seemed he had a knack to pierce deeply into our reality and understand things that others simply could not. But all was not good in his childhood. His isolated intellectual upbringing left him ill-equipped to handle the harsh realities of the real world. He commented on this himself, noting, My life did not prepare me for the fact that the world is full of cruel and bitter things. This came to a dramatic head when he went to an all-boys summer camp when he was 14 years old. Despite being locked in an ice house naked with his genitals painted green and left overnight by the other boys, Oppenheimer stoically claimed in a letter to his mother that he was glad to be at camp because it was teaching him about the facts of life. However, although he seemed to have been affected very little, this would affect his outlook on social life well into adulthood, even pushing him to adopt the view that he needed physics and poetry more than he needed friends. He would spend the entirety of his young adult life in the library, absorbing science, philosophy, and poetry. His method of learning and vast intellect meant he would often leap right past the basics and jump into the most abstract and difficult problems in a given field, somehow being able to grasp them without the solid foundations. While he often did this successfully, he did admit that he would, at times, be insecure about gaps in his knowledge because of it. This hastiness would be both his strength and his weakness when it came time for the Manhattan Project later on. But for now, he managed to breeze through school, taking extra courses at Harvard and quickly making his way over to Cambridge, 
to begin his graduate work in physics. But this also showed up in his inability to get a handle on doing laboratory work. His mind was so caught up in the bigger picture, so capable even at times of bypassing experimentation in his head, that the slow and arduous work of running experiments took its toll on him. At this point, too, his unstable emotions began to bubble up. From poisoning his tutor's apple to kissing a stranger in a carriage car, Oppenheimer seemed to be coming apart at the seams. But it only seemed like that from the point of view of someone who does not understand him, which admittedly may be impossible to fully do. A classmate even once found him staring at a blank chalkboard repeating the same line over and over again. The point is, the point is, the point is. Most would be quick to say that something like this was surely showing symptoms of a mental condition, and in fact, that is exactly what happened. The Freudian psychoanalyst who treated him diagnosed him with dementia praecox for symptoms that most closely associate with schizophrenia today, writing in his records that he was a hopeless case whose further analysis would do more harm than good. Oppenheimer refused to accept this diagnosis and instead sought to cure whatever was going on with him on his own. He fixed what appeared to be clinical madness by reading Marcel Proust's novel In Search of Lost Time and taking a bicycle tour in Corsica. One of his few friends, a fellow physicist named Francis Ferguson, had a family-owned ranch in New Mexico where Oppenheimer recovered from another illness. This is one of those moments where fate seems undeniable. This location in New Mexico, which is now ingrained into the memory of America, would later serve as the home of over 6,000 men and women working on the atomic bomb. And it was this cathartic outdoor experience during graduate school that directly led to Oppenheimer's choice of the location. He would go on to receive his PhD in physics from the University of Göttingen, Germany, in 1927. He had worked with famous physicists like Max Born and had made a name for himself despite his atypical learning style. Okay, let's fast forward a bit. Oppenheimer has now been a professor at Caltech for some years. He wasn't a particularly political person, but as he watched the approach of World War II and the rise of Adolf Hitler unfold, he felt disturbed by the apocalyptic possibilities that fascism presented. I think this is one of the most fascinating things about Oppenheimer and many other deep thinkers. You tend to find that they have trouble expressing feelings of care, attention, and love with many of those close by in their life, preferring their work to any kind of social life. But what you also find is a deep love for all of humanity that people who obsess over their personal social lives tend to lack. Oppenheimer's love for metaphysical poetry and philosophy were deeply tied to his sense of morality and duty to protect the future of humankind. However, his impulses as a curious scientist would cause a great conflict within him. A conflict that represents the collective conscience of all of mankind at a time when everything seemed to be falling apart and even the good guys were doing horrific things. It is at this time when he was selected to run the Manhattan Project. President Roosevelt received a worrying letter from Einstein and other physicists warning him that the knowledge of quantum physics in Germany was immense and that if Hitler wanted it, they could certainly build a bomb. And he wasn't foolish enough to think that that's something Hitler would not want. Oppenheimer's conflicting impulses for deep scientific discovery and a responsibility to human life would haunt him through and beyond the development of the atomic bomb. At times, he could barely take the guilt and fear surrounding the implications of his creation. What he needed was something that would guide him, in an almost spiritual way, through this grand task. He wasn't a religious man, but he was a highly philosophical one, and it was in one of the oldest, most profound texts in human history that he found the courage to push through. This was the Bhagavad Gita. He knew the world would not be the same, Few people laughed, few people cried, most people were silent. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita, Vishnu is trying to persuade the prince that he should do his duty and to impress him, takes on his multi-armed form and says, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. 
I suppose we all thought that one way or another. The Bhagavad Gita is a sacred Hindu scripture and an integral part of the Indian epic, the Mahabharata. It consists of a conversation between Prince Arjuna and Lord Krishna, who serves as his charioteer and spiritual guide. Set on the battlefield of Kurukshetra, the main story revolves around a great war between two factions of a royal family. Arjuna, a skilled warrior, finds himself overwhelmed with doubt and moral dilemmas as he faces his relatives, teachers, and friends on the opposing side. Overwhelmed by compassion and sorrow, he questions the righteousness of engaging in a world that will inevitably cause immense suffering and loss of life. In response to Arjuna's despair, Lord Krishna imparts spiritual wisdom and guidance, revealing profound philosophical and practical insights. Krishna elucidates the nature of the self, the concept of duty, and the paths to attain spiritual liberation. He emphasizes the importance of performing one's duty without attachment to the fruits of action and advocates for a path of selfless service, devotion, and meditation. Ultimately, the Bhagavad Gita offers a comprehensive guide to righteous living, self-realization, and the attainment of spiritual enlightenment, transcending the immediate context of the battlefield and providing timeless teachings for seekers of truth and seekers of a meaningful life. Oppenheimer even believed this text could be more important than his own project with the atomic bomb, once saying, Access to the Vedas is the greatest privilege this century may claim over all previous centuries. If one could single out a short list of items he pulled from the wisdom of these ancient philosophers, they would be duty, fate, and faith. He believed that he had a job to do, that he should do it only because it was his job and not because he was intent on obtaining any particular result and that following these principles would bring a saving measure of serenity into his profoundly discontented existence. In Oppenheimer's philosophy, these three precepts were not ornamental but structural. Without them, he would have been a different man. Without the inspiration of the Gita, Oppenheimer might not have been able or willing to direct Los Alamos. Without Oppenheimer's skill, determined action, Los Alamos might not have produced an atomic bomb in time to be used on Japan. When presented with two evils and forced to walk the path of duty, he and the other scientists at Los Alamos chose to believe they were doing the right thing. But many would harbor the psychological scars of this event for the rest of their lives. And I think this is actually the most interesting part of this story. Yes, the bomb, the war, all of that is very interesting. But the conflict within the very people that created the most destructive weapon in human history up to that point, that might give us some real insight it might teach us something special about what makes us human. Oppenheimer did his best to recognize his own biases, once noting, when we deny evil within ourselves, we dehumanize ourselves, and we deprive ourselves of not only our own destiny, but of any possibility of dealing with the evil of others. You see, all along through this process of making the bomb, these scientists were having the time of their lives. They had unlimited funding and support, to explore their deepest passion and the satisfaction of actually seeing their discoveries and work be brought to life. While many of them expressed regret about the use of the bomb, they all reflected positively on their time at Los Alamos. This raises the question, when is it right to say no more discovery? And when is it right to stay the course? In fact, they had a chance to avoid the creation of this bomb altogether, a chance to stop when the whole reason for beginning in the first place was gone. This was VE Day, the day that Germany was defeated and the threat of an enemy bomb was completely gone. They all gathered for a meeting to discuss whether they should continue with the Trinity test, the first detonation of an atomic bomb. They were all unsure, but many would have been devastated to throw so many years of hard work out the window. Regardless, it was all up to Oppenheimer. The weight of the future literally rested on his shoulders at this very moment. One can only imagine how he must have felt, and I think it's safe to say he remembered Arjuna in that moment. Remembered the tragic part of life where no matter what one does, horrible things will happen. Oppenheimer said that they would proceed, and the rest is history. But then came Japan. A short time ago, an American airplane dropped one bomb on Hiroshima. That bomb has more power than 20,000 tons of TNT. An entire city incinerated in nine seconds. Tens of thousands instantly vaporized, and hundreds of thousands who died later. 
a country that was defeated in all but an official surrender, a country at the mercy of American military might and vengeance, was subject to not one, but two civilian demonstrations of this doomsday weapon. Apparently the military even intentionally spared Hiroshima and Nagasaki from the firebombs that ravaged the rest of the country so they could have the best experiment with the bomb. Oppenheimer was horrified by this, noting that the U.S. could easily have dropped the bomb on a sparsely populated military target that would have perfectly demonstrated its destructive power. Even so, Oppenheimer did not regret that they had completed their task, because he had the foresight to see that the world was headed towards an atomic future no matter what, and he felt that if they could just get ahead of it, if they could just show the people and politicians of the world what a future conflict would look like, that it could quite literally end the world, it might actually lead to a better, more peaceful world. I find this almost impossible to criticize. On the one hand, it's clear that the world is far more dangerous with nuclear weapons. But on the other hand, the threat of mutual destruction kept the two most powerful forces the globe has ever seen from engaging in a global conflict that would have dwarfed World War II. But who is to say what might have happened and what could still happen? What I want to answer here is what we can learn from this event and this man. Oppenheimer reveals to us how difficult it is to be a good person, to be a happy and fulfilled person with a clear conscience. The world is always pressing the impossible upon us, forcing us to choose between two things we want or don't want, forcing us to be someone when we don't even know ourselves yet, forcing us to take action, at the same time live with guilt and regret no matter what path we take. But if one tries, if one fights like hell to be better for themselves and those around them, tries to do good and to love those that deserve it, to bring joy instead of pain, laughter instead of anguish, one might just be able to take it. In battle, in forest, at the precipice in the mountains, on the dark great sea, in the midst of javelins and arrows, in sleep, in confusion, in the depths of shame, the good deeds a man has done before defend him. So, let's get back to the original question posed in this video. What exactly is Oppenheimer's gift? Well, I think his gift is his love. His love for you and I. His love for all living things. Yes, he was instrumental in creating this terrible weapon. But he knew someone else could do it, and would do it. Instead of being a cold, rational scientist dead set on discovery, he dedicated much of the remainder of his life fighting tooth and nail to guide the course of atomic development constantly pushing back on government policies and politicians, always advocating for a path that leads to peace, not destruction. He doesn't just step aside and say tough times call for tough measures. He bore the moral weight, the painful guilt of this great event on his shoulders for the rest of his time on this earth, hoping all along he did enough so that you and I might have a chance to see a little bit of this world, a chance to laugh, cry, and smile, to touch all the highs and lows of life, what he demonstrated for us is that life is not the black and white story we are shown. It's not perfect for anyone ever, but it is worth it.